Welcome back one and all to the game lore series, where I, Questionable Ole, explore the in-game lore and history of different games. This video is the third part of the original Might and Magic Universe timeline, which will cover the most event-rich period known as the Age of Men. Brace yourself, as I will cover events spanning 14 different game titles, from Might and Magic 3, Isles of Terra, to Heroes Chronicles, Sword of the Frost. Let us get started. In early years of this age, Kingdom of Phinexia briefly falls under Erethia's rule, but when Aaron IV expands further into Abdus territory, he is killed there, and the elves wipe out the remainder of Phinexia's lands. Meanwhile, powerful mage daggers are constructed by the warlocks of Alchemical Alliance. Teladon X raises to power in the Church of the Sun, and is one of the most powerful figures of the times. He dies from extreme bad luck due to an artifact he carries with him at all times. In early 900s, first major conflict between Churches of Sun and Moon takes place. First Temple of Sun is burnt, its holy altar melted, and the shield named Eclipse is forged out of it. Succeeding priest carries the shield into the Shadow Spire region in Jedem, but is killed there. Some time later, Archer's Guild develops a lethal bow Persual, and are suspiciously sabotaged, resulting in the halt of bow's past production. The only copy is eventually sold off to elves. I wonder why. A joint human-elven offensive attacks Assassin's Guild, but presumably the guild survives. In Jadam, powerful necromancer Zaharia rises to power, commands legions of the dead and enslaves majority of the continent. In Enroth, future sorceress Jem and necromancer Sandro are born. Sandro will become a student of warlock Ethric of Bracada, but would later wander to paths of necromancy and ultimately become a leech. With the help of powerful crown artifact Arthur, Leopold VII from the Church of the Sun launches a holy war against the Church of the Moon in Jadam. Zaharia is slain during the siege of the Shadow Spire, thus his reign becomes obsolete. We will now take a look at two of the Tarnum's the Barbarian adventures, which happened one after another. First one is called the World Tree. After hearing a cryptic plea from ancestors, save the World Tree, Tarnum begins his search for the place. He finds an entrance into a cavern besieged by necromancers and assumes that they were that implied threat. After dealing with them, he learns, however, there is a hostile barbarian army further down into the caverns, led by no other than the ancestor War, one of the three great ancestors. War apparently assumed power after a chieftain of a barbarian tribe, Targor, began worshipping an ancient barbarian tyrant, which prompted War to assume tyrant's identity and go mad destroy the world tree, which will spell the end of entire world. Tarnum procured the artifact pendant of Total Recall and uses it on the Targor to show him the true identity of Barbarian Tyrant and tell his story. Targor, shocked and ashamed, goes to the war to inform of the end of the warship, but never returns. Tarnum later finds a pile of mutilated corpses, one of which is Targors. The World Tree is saved nevertheless, as War abandons his bid and retreats somewhere. Tarnum follows him. This brings us to the Fiery Moon Chronicle. While on the War's trail, Tarnum stumbles on a familiar called Skizik, who was once in service of War and the Devils. Skizik tells Tarnum that it was by his mistake that ancestors who were imprisoned on a fiery moon planet were able to slip a message to Tarnum in the first place. Needless to say, 
Skizik is no longer welcomed on the fiery moon. With great difficulties, Skizik leads Tardum to a sparking bridge, a portal used to go to various places, one of them the fiery moon. Finally, they found the portal, acquired Ring of the Wayfarer, which activated it and went through. Several days into Fiery Moon, Skizik falls into a pit in the ground and partly discovers a stronghold of unknown origin. Skizik says that it is a ruins of civilization which was here before his former masters, the Kriegans, attacked the planet. Soon, Tarnum finds Inferno Citadel Black Dome, where he defeats Zyron the Jailer and manages to free two ancestors. Tarnum confronts war, but neither side gains victory. Skizik and Tarnum are wounded and separated. They gather armies individually and finally find each other as they prepare for one more assault. Tarnum defeats war and, instead of killing him, asked by ancestors, gives him a sap of world tree to cure his madness. Everybody else survives, and this concludes the chronicle. Moving on, around year 1110 after silence, Nicholas Griffonhart is born. He becomes famous for banishing necromancy from Arathia and securing peace treaty with Statalia, which will last until his death. Morgan Ironfist and his allies flee the Varn for Nacell from the usurper brother Ragnar through a one-way portal and they end up on the continent of Enroth. Morglin founds that Enroth has no clear ruler and starts his campaign to conquer it. This starts the first war of the Enrothian succession. It all starts near the town of Gateway, where Morglin finds himself and three other warlords, Slayer the Barbarian, Alamar the Walrock, and Lamanda the Sorceress. Morglin takes over the town. To continue his advance, Morglin conquers the archipelago, collation of islands controlled by different lords. Once he set foot in the actual Enroth continent, he found the Eye of Goros artifact which allowed him to unite nearby lands. With Morglin controlling a territory, other lords begin taking him seriously. Fierce battle ensues in the central Enroth region, with Morglin securing victory. Other lords retreat back into their territories. Morglin's first target is Lord Slayer in the Frozen Highlands. He achieves victory there swiftly. Moving on to Elven Forest Lands, Morglin tries to take over Lamanda's castle, but she sabotages the entrance to her port. Morglin prevails in the end, finding another route. Warlocks in the castle Alamar are sure no one would get past the Binotar maze, but underestimate Morglin, who shatters their unprepared defense in the end. In the last bid to stand up to Morglin, three lords unite against him. He manages to conquer the Dragon Citadel and uses Dragon to defeat the lords. In the end, Morglin unites in Roth and is declared the undisputed High King. Moving on, a new generation of notable characters is born. Tarnum settles for a peaceful time in Avli. Years 1151 to 1154 mark the Second War of Enrothian Succession, which begins with the death of Morglin. Archibald Ironfist kills the seer who's supposed to make a decision and his three successors, bribing the fourth one to declare Archibald one true heir. Roland is exiled. Roland begins gathering an army to march against Archibald, secures help of the Lord Hart commander in Morglan's army, aids dwarven king Rocklin, and helps sorceresses of Norastom. Archibald secures help of necromancers, warlocks and pirates of Regna, but fails to get help from Melian, Oracle of Enroth. Angered, he steals Melian's cores and spreads them across the continent. In the final battle, Roland is victorious, and Archibald is turned to stone as punishment. 
This concludes the Second War of Nerothian Succession. In the few following years, Catherine marries Roland to secure alliance between Enroth and Erathia. Jem, Sandro, Craig Huck, and Lord Hart all travel to Antagorich for one reason or another. Next sequence of events will predominantly fall under a Shadow of Death game, but some are taken from elsewhere and placed in here chronologically. Sandra meets Jem and Crack Hack, deceives them into finding necromantic artifacts for him under the pretext of wanting to destroy them. Once he gets the artifacts, however, he vanishes into thin air. Jem alerts Earthric about Sandra's betrayal, and he mounts an offensive against Sandra, bidding to prevent him from reaching Deja, the land of necromancers. Sandra kills his former teacher and reanimates him as a leech. In Deja, Sandra secures alliance with power-hungry but strategically and politically inept leech Lord Phineas Vilmar, and plans him as king of Deja. At this point, we'll switch to a story of Murtare, an ambitious Nyon overlord, on the move to assert more power. Her next target is Ordwald, but he is absent in search for the vial of the dragon blood. Murtare finds and defeats him, claiming the vial for herself. She drinks from the vial and is turned into sentient dragon, Mutare Drake. She henceforth has control over the majority of dragons on the planet. This takes us directly into Clash of the Dragons Hero Chronicle. Good dragons in Avli suddenly leave. Tarnum leaves Fire Witch Adrienne to care for the foster child Verjak to seek them out. Tarnum learns that Mutare is responsible for compelling the dragons. He steals the vial from Mutare and uses it on ten kidnapped golden dragon mothers, freeing them from Mutare's control. Meanwhile, Mutare secures support of other great dragons – Rust, Crystal and Azure. To counter this, Tarnum seeks out the help of fairy dragons. Kerbon, a dwarf in charge of Tarnum's weaponry, turns out to be a spy for Mutare. That's how she knows all of Tarnum's moves in advance. After being found out, Kerbon flees to Nyon. Tarnum advances into Nyon, where he presses Kerbon to come to his senses. Kerbon sacrifices himself and his troops to save Velita, a ranger he previously abducted. Tarnum crushes Mutare's army, forcing her to flee. While she is plotting her revenge, she is killed by an unknown aspiring overlord, in the same manner she had killed her master in her youth. Moving on with the Shadow of Death events, Jem, Gelo, Yog, and Craig Hack assemble a sword named Angelic Alliance, use it to defeat Sandro, forcing him to retreat into Deja. Another significant event in planet's history comes to pass, a night of the shooting stars, where Kriegans arrive. They establish a foothold in Antagorich and Enroth. Territories of Eofol, Kriegspire and Paradise Valley are seized. To lower the morale and integrity of Enroth, Xenofex, Kriegan leader, establishes a cult of Ba. They undermine rule of law and seed discord in the general populace. Roland Ironfist mounts an offensive and is captured by Kriegans in Kriegspire and is later transported to Erathia. Initial Kriegan expansion in Antagorich is subdued by dungeon overlords. At this point we will need to take a break from events on the planet Enroth and conclude the story of Sheltem and Korak told through the games of Might and Magic series 3, 4 and 5. A party of eight local adventurers in Terra follow Korak, who arrived not long ago after his recovery on Kron. Party gains access to lower levels of the planet, where they disrupt Sheltem and Korak's battle. 
Sheltem escapes into the world of Zine. Korak follows him and motions adventurers to take second shuttle, Lincoln, and follow them. Adventurers, however, never reach Zin and steer into another region. Sheltem and Korak both land on the dark side of Zin cell. Korak seems to be stuck in a stasis field. On the light side, someone named Lord Zin emerges as a tyrant and is defeated by a party of local adventurers. They follow a hidden path into the dark side of the nacelle. Adventurers stumble on the artifact called the Orb of the Dragon Pharaoh, which leads them to the sanctuary of Zin's guardian. Pharaoh directs adventurers to help Korak. They transfer Korak's essence into a soul box and smuggle it into Shelton's fortress. Battle ensues that results in self-destruction of both Guardians, thus bringing the threat of Shelton to a bittersweet end. Back in Antagorich, Sandro forges alliance between Nion, Deja and Kriegans. Lord Hart reveals his true allegiance to necromancers and poisons Nicholas Griffonheart, killing him. In Enroth, party of four adventurers free Archibald Ironfist and learn a ritual of the Void spell from him, which they use to safely destroy Kriegan hive ship and destroy the Kriegan queen. The events that follow become known as the Restoration of Erethia. Catherine sails back to Erethia to mourn her father's death and restore order. Once there, she rallies Avli and Brakeda and reclaims Stedwick Erethia's capital, which was sacked by dungeon overlords. Lucifer Kriegan, commander of Eiffel armies, sends envoy to Erethia, telling that they have Roland held captive back in Eiffel. Avli invades, but fails to rescue him. Dejan necromancers, who were responsible for Nicholas Griffenhardt's death, revive him as a leech to make him a commander general of their armies, but he goes rogue and seizes control of all of Deja instead. Necromancers and Catherine have no other choice but to join forces against Nicholas to prevent him from gaining too much power. Nicholas is eradicated and Lord Hart is slain. Archibald Ironfist becomes the king of Deja. At this point, Terence in the Lincoln unit arrive into Brighton Point region near Atangarich. Divided about further actions, they split up, four of them going to Gavin Magnus in Brocada to try to restore Webstation Beta 5 access, other four are going to Deja to try to reactivate Heavenly Forge to control all of this planet. Local adventurers become lords of Harmondale and assist Gaving and Resurrecta with reviving the gate. They slay Xenofex and free Roland Ironfist along the way. Not long after, Lord Hart is reanimated by followers of his Necromantic Order. Order's headquarters are moved to Shadowspire region in Jedam. Sandra and Thant succeed Archibald Ironfist as guildmasters. We are now ready to explore sequence of events that fall under Armageddon's Blade campaign. After Xenofex's death, Lucifer Gregan succeeds control of Eofall. Before dying, however, Xenofex imparts a vision of the destructive sword Armageddon's Blade to Lucifer. Lucifer sends Zeron, his commander, to assemble the blade. Eradia, Avli with Jello, and elementals from the Confluxes launch an attack on Eofall. With Eradia and Avli busy, Adrienne, the Fire Witch, rallies Tatalia's forces against Lord Hart's cult and eradicates them. Zeron creates the blade, but Gelo intercepts him on the way back to Eofall. At the behest of Queen Catherine, Gelo uses the blade to slay Lucifer Kriegan. Catherine allows Gelo to keep the blade in the end. 
A year later, Eschaton, another ancient guardian tasked with eradicating Kriegans from reworld worlds, arrives to the planet, lands in Jedem, and begins the convocation of Cataclysm, a procedure which will result in destruction of the planet. Local party of adventurers eventually sets out to prevent this. They manage to track Eschaton in the plane between planes, where he admits that there is no longer a need to destroy this world, as Kriegans are already taken care of. However, his programming prevents him from stopping the procedure. He has no problem, however, allowing adventurers to steal keys to elemental lords imprisoned by Eschaton earlier. Adventurers free the lords, and they stop the convocation. We are now entering the final sequence of events before the reckoning, a race for the Sword of Frost. Gelo sets out to destroy the Sword of Frost. Tarnum, knowing the ancient prophecy about collision of two swords, Armageddon's blade and the Sword of Frost, wants to prevent this from happening. Lacking a proper army, Tarnum seizes weakened overlords of Neon, who are the only ones willing to fight Gelo. Tarnum's friend Kligor's third wife, Kija, learns of the sword and sets out to retrieve it for her husband so that her son would be chosen for future leader. Gelo, being a half warrior elf, has support from the natives and they fight against Tarnum and Kija. Well, Tarnum can't convince Kija or Gelo to give up their search, so he acquires help of Azure Dragons to give him an edge in battle. Tarnum captures Gelo's friend, Dwarf Ufratin, when he was setting an ambush for Tarnum. Ufratin does not speak to Tarnum at all, branding him a traitor to the elves. Tarnum fails to convince the Dwarf otherwise, and decides to escort him back to Elven Camp, as he does not wish him any harm. Warmed by this gesture, Ufratin tells Tarnum that Gelo is seeking the hidden city of Voli. Tarnum manages to catch up to Gelo, engages and successfully stops him, only to find out that the Sword of Frost was stolen by Kija a short time before. This point is considered the end of the Sword of Frost race, with a more menacing event just around the corner. And here it is, the Reckoning. Disregarding Tarnum's warning, Gelo returned to Antagorich and waged war against Kilgore, desperate to destroy the Sword of Frost. As predicted, clashing over Megaron's blade and the Sword of Frost evoked a destruction wave which became to be known as the Reckoning. Gelo and Kilgore die on impact. Pockets of planet's population manage to flee to a new world named Axioth via a chain of mysteriously opened portals throughout the continents. And this concludes the turbulent age of men. We are at the end of the video. If you find it enjoyable, click a like button, leave your thoughts down in the comment section below, and hit the subscribe and bell buttons to get notified about future videos. Thank you all so much, I hope you enjoyed it, Ole out!